Um, so the teaching text today uh, is from Luke 15, verses 1 to 7. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country to go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. This is the word of the Lord. Well, very good evening to you. I hope you're doing well. Uh, we're continuing, continuing along in this series on the I Am Statements of Jesus. I was uh, so caught up in the shepherding heart of Jesus last week that I thought, I just felt compelled to do a part two on shepherding. So uh, just break in with the series, not that you care, but here we go. Uh, I had the privilege of speaking at the Alpha Conference out in Phoenix, and I was thinking about the person of Jesus, and I was just, this was deep in my mind, I'm going to talk to churches about uh, the importance of creating environments for people to encounter Jesus, and uh, I had forgotten my reading glasses, I needed a pair of reading glasses, so I stopped into one of those Hudson, uh, Hudson rip-off stores at the airport, and uh, I'm in there, and as I'm looking for the glasses, I look right past where the glasses are, and I see this uh, magazine about Jesus, if we can pop this picture up. And uh, it says right here, who do you say that I am? Here's Jesus at the Hudson store in the airport asking me this question. <laughs> Tucked in nicely between a memorial to the life of George W. Bush Sr. and 100 photos that changed the world. I was just so struck by the reality that Jesus is issuing this haunting cry. Why can't we get rid of Jesus? This question just seems to insist on every generation an answer. Who do you say that I am? So I fly out to Phoenix when it was negative four and uh, whatever it was in New York. I'm out in Phoenix having a lovely time. And uh, during one of the talks there, one of the speakers drops these statistics from a new Barna study that had just come out called Reviving Evangelism. And here's the statistic. Christianity uh, Today picked it up. If we can run to the next slide. And the one before that. And uh, this is what it says. Half of millennial Christians say it's wrong to evangelize. Now, this is quite extraordinary. This is the actual phrase that they said here. Um, 40% of practicing Christian millennials, churchgoers who consider religion an important part of their lives, believe evangelism is wrong. And uh, the, the language is so fascinating. It is wrong to share one's personal beliefs with someone of a different faith in hopes that one day they will share the same faith. Now, what's fascinating about this statistic from these people who are following Jesus is that in this passage, we have Jesus doing evangelism. The thing we love about Jesus is the fact that he tried to reach people. He tried to care for people. He tried to persuade them away from their sin and their brokenness and their shame and their guilt. And he tried to convert them into his followers so that they could find life and they could find joy. And so Jesus' whole ministry in some ways could be described as evangelism. He was going around trying to persuade people that he was the Messiah and that the kingdom of God who, uh, was actually there. Now, the crazy thing is, is that sinners loved Jesus. It's amazing. So apparently for Jesus, evangelism wasn't a weird thing. It was an amazing thing. And, and apparently for the people on the receiving end of Jesus' attempts to change them, they loved it. They loved the change that Jesus offers. So Jesus has these sinners and tax, tax collectors gathering around him as he's preaching. Now, at the same moment that 50% of millennials are saying, I don't think it's appropriate to convert people. They say this at the exact same time, 94% of millennials believe the best thing that can happen to someone is that they can meet Jesus. So, I mean, you've got, you've got this challenge right here. It's too... Uh, stay, too you are one, steady. Okay. So, so just this point here. Now, a lot of people look at this and they want to do that. They want to hate. They want to just be like, oh, this is so pathetic. This is lazy, whatever. What's happening here? In the hearts of followers of Jesus, you have a desire to share about Jesus, but you think it's wrong to do it. What is actually happening? So I, my honest thought about this is, yes, there are some people who have lost Jesus' heart. Some people have lost Jesus' heart. And they've just got religion as basically a self-help tool or they've turned it into sort of consumer Christianity. 
that is true. That actually happens, I think, disproportionately more in New York than other places that you would think. It can sometimes, if you're not from New York, when you move to the city, it can be very, very hard to sort of get that apartment, settle into the job, and then find a faith community. And if you're married, to get your, your spouse supported. And if you have kids, get them in the right schools. And if you're single, make sure that you're available to all the amazing people that New York opens up to you. I mean, there's all of these pressures, these pressures. And so if you're not careful, your world gets very, very, very small. And it's basically reduced to me caring about my own life. But I don't think that's primarily what's happening, though it does happen. Here's what I think is happening. Is people are simply overwhelmed by the challenges of our culture. They're just overwhelmed by the environment, the cultural moment that we find ourselves in. Multiple religious traditions, diverse cultural traditions, complicated ethical questions, from bioethics to new forms of human relationships and sexuality, the continuing struggle to integrate faith and politics, the new opportunities for constructive dialogue between liberals and evangelicals within one church, the lived integration of one's corporate beliefs with one's corporate practice. There are so many challenges. Now you throw all of that on top of the general angst that most people feel in their hearts. How can Jesus be the only way to God? How can a loving God send people to hell? What about pain and suffering? What about science and faith? Can you even really trust the Bible anyway? Look at all the horrible things that the church has done to African Americans. Look what the church has done to minorities in the past. It's just, it's been horrific. And what about LGBTQI people and the church's response to that? I think it's safe to say that most people feel like they need a PhD in apologetics and ethics to answer the question, I went to church this weekend. <laughs> what did you do this weekend? I went to church. Oh, really? Good. I've got a few questions about that. Let's just go through my list. And so I think a lot of people just feel overwhelmed. They live in a society that says you should never try and persuade anybody as if that's a neutral statement. But they, we live in a society that it just feels like people are overwhelmed. They don't know how to interact with the rest of this. When I first moved to the United States, um, I came from Australia, which is uh, more secular than America, if you didn't know. And uh, I moved to a tiny little town, actually was in their minds a thriving metropolis called Tekoa, Georgia. <laughs> wow. Two hours northeast of Atlanta, 85 forever. And uh, you get off and you go through the woods and uh, Stevens County. Amazing. And uh, so you, you get there, and I remember just being shocked. People said to me, hey, do you want to go pick up some supplies from Walmart? And I was like, what's Walmart? And people are like, this is going to be fun. This is going to be fun. <laughs> do you want to go to Taco Bell? What's Taco Bell? I mean, I've never had Mexican food. Are you kidding? Everything I did was fun. So, uh, but we go, we go to Walmart, and I'm in Walmart, and we're checking out, and there is a wall of Christian books. And there was multiple Bible translations, and it was honestly bigger. This wall was bigger than any Christian bookstore I had ever seen in Australia. I just remember looking at this, just thinking, where am I? Where am I? This is Walmart. They sell Snickers and study Bibles. I mean, what is, what is happening in America? It just blew my mind. And I realized um, that I was living in a cultural framework in the deep south where Jesus was assumed. Where if you said you need to get right with God, they probably thought you meant the Christian God. And that you knew if you wanted to, you'd go back down to First Baptist and you'd walk the aisle at the altar call. You knew what it meant by God and getting right with God. You knew where to go. You knew how to do it. So in a cultural reference point, if we can jump over to the slide with Acts 2, 10 and 17. I've mentioned this before, but I want us to feel this. We have to understand the distance that we are from an assumed Christian framework in our society. And I think this is what people wrestle with. See, in Acts chapter 2, it's like, it's like being in Tekoa, Georgia. You just say God, and they're like, got it, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. Look, I have a tattoo. I mean, they totally understand the Christian faith. And if you read the, the, the preaching in Acts chapter 2 of the Apostle Peter, you realize it contains references to the Psalms. It's got a, a, a prophecy from the prophet Joel. And he basically says, you know the God I'm talking about. And you killed his Messiah, and he rose from the dead, and now God's going to send you the Holy Spirit. And they knew which God, what they had to do to be saved, and who the Messiah was a reference point for. Very, very easily. Acts chapter 10, you, if you read these accounts, I encourage you to go home and read these. Acts chapter 10, the sermon to Cornelius. Now, who is Cornelius? Remember, he's a Roman centurion, which means he's one of the enemies of the people of Israel. He's a part of the military, uh, invading and oppressing force. And so when Peter begins to preach the gospel to them, he has 
some reference points that they would understand, but it's way different than his sermon in Acts chapter 2 because the gospel's now moving away from an assumed context. But when you get to Acts 17, and I encourage you to read Paul's account in Acts chapter 17 of what the gospel is, he doesn't start with the God of Israel. He doesn't start with any sort of shared framework. He used to go all the way back to creation. So he's like, hey, you know, you, uh, you, by the way, you're very religious. I certainly commend that. Um, there's an unknown God, and he's the God that made everything, the heavens and the earth and everything within them. And so he has to start all the way back at the basic shared assumption there is a God and you don't know what his name is. Let me fill in some of the gaps for you. Now, I say all of this, so you've got the God of covenant saving the children of covenant, the God of promise saving everyone who believes, and then in Acts 17, the God of creation saving the children of creation. Now, here's why I bring this up. You know right now in Manhattan that you're in Acts 17. You know that, don't you? And so a lot of the tension we have is that we've been trained in Acts 2 instincts and at best Acts 10, but we live in an Acts 17 culture which we just don't know how to back away from the heated debates and come up with shared frameworks and perspectives to even have a thoughtful conversation about the God it is that we serve. Now, all that still being said, even though our culture's changed, God's heart hasn't changed. Even though our culture moves further and further away from Him, God's heart gets stronger and stronger and stronger and His desire to bring people back to Himself. So we have to embrace the priority of heaven. No matter how hard the culture is, no matter how godless or how secular or how distant it is, it's your and my responsibility right now. That's why you're alive right now. You you weren't born in the past. You're not born in the future. You're here now because you're the people that God has entrusted His mission to in this Acts 17 context. And we have to embrace this priority regardless of what the statistics say. In this parable, Jesus leaves the 99 to find the one. So you see that there's 99 believers. Yet Jesus leaves them in the open field to find the one. And Will mentioned promoting Alpha a couple of weeks ago. And Pete Gregg mentioned that, that in the last 20 years or so, that the evangelical church in attendance in New York City has grown from about 1% or so to 5% or so. And everybody's just like, this is amazing. And it's quite good. It's actually quite good. But if Jesus is disproportionately committed to the lost and he leaves the 99 to find the one and we're at 5%, don't you think that Jesus would leave the 5% to find the 95%? Don't you think his heart would just swell up? He would be moved with compassion and he would say, somebody, please change your metrics. Somebody, please look at the opportunity before you. Be on mission with me. I'm the shepherd that seeks and saves that which is lost. Now, when I put all of this out there, I don't want to create fear like, oh, I don't know how to do it. I already feel bad. I'm not great at this. And is this one of those like, you suck, try harder? Not at all. Not at all. (laughs) I'm not into that. You should know me by now. I remember hearing a sermon years and years ago by a pastor named Mark Middleburg. And he wrote this book called Becoming a Contagious Christian. And I've shared this Uh, some of this stuff with our church before, but I just felt compelled to share it because I'm listening to half a generation feel overwhelmed and not share their faith. And I'm looking at the opportunity we have in our moment. I just want everybody to be fluent in this, everybody to understand how God's made them and how everybody can participate in Jesus' mission here in the city. Now, how many of you have um, know know your Enneagram number? Someone wooted uh, for the Enneagram. That's fantastic. Um, (laughs) How many of you know your Myers Briggs? It's all oh, okay. Disc. It's good, isn't it? Honestly, don't you love that stuff? I love that stuff. It's like, oh, tell me more about me. <laughs> it's really fascinating. I did, all, I did all of this. That's really funny. I did. That's pretty good. I, I am special. I did, uh, I did all of this with my kids, and I just watched them normally not want to, you know, like, how's it going? Good. What are, you, what are you doing later? Nothing. Uh, do you want to talk to the Enneagram? Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Three and a half hours later, they're still like, you know what? What does this mean for me? So I, I just say all this to say, in this talk tonight, it's, I want you to consider it as sort of a framework like that. 
Okay? These are evangelism styles, and they basically mean that there's a way that you're sort of naturally inclined or even supernaturally inspired or gifted to be able to respond to people with the gospel. And I find this very, very freeing because it doesn't take one approach and moralize it and say this is the biblical way. It basically says there's all of these biblical ways of getting people to Jesus. And as I'm going through this tonight, I want you just to be sitting there saying, is that me? Is that me? Is that me? Okay, let's jump into these evangelism styles. Style number one, the testimonial style, okay? And this is a way of sharing the good news with Jesus. John chapter 9, there's an account where Jesus heals a man who's been born blind. The Pharisees don't appreciate the timing and manner in which Jesus has done this. So they're angry. They don't see the miracle. They see the scandal. And uh, so the family's under pressure. They're, they're threatening to put them out of the synagogue. And so they eventually, you know, and the, and the parents so were just like, let, the, let him speak for himself. He's an adult. And so he comes in and they just start questioning him. Jesus, you know, the way that he does his ministry violates our boundary laws. He could never be from God. Uh, confess, this man's a sinner. And his response is classic. It's like, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. Here's what I know. An hour ago, I couldn't see you. And now you guys look amazing. You guys look great. I couldn't see. Now I can see. That's what I know about Jesus. So uh, who, if he's a sinner or whatever, that's your problem. I'm enjoying, I'm enjoying my sight. This is his basic response to this. Just shares. Look, I don't know. I don't understand all the answers. I don't get it all. I, I can just see. I can just see. This 100% was my approach as a new believer. I hadn't read anything. I didn't know what apologetics... I thought apologetics meant that you were sorry that you were a Christian. You know, I didn't know, I didn't know what it meant. So people would say to me like, oh, you're a Christian now. That stuff's rubbish. Do you believe in evolution? I was like, I don't, I've never read a book on evolution in my life. I have no idea about science and God. I just know I hated my life and now I feel totally free and filled with joy. Like, what are you doing with your life? And so people would... But they would bring up... They would bring up all of these questions for which I sincerely and genuinely had no answer. I'd just be like, I don't know, man. That sounds very credible. I hated my life and now I love my life. That's all I got for you, man. Do you want to come to church? Do you want to meet Jesus? Don't underestimate the power of your story. People aren't asking you to solve all the problems in the universe. They're just asking what happened to you. You, they don't have to agree with what happened to you. They're just saying, what is that? And you say, this is Jesus. Jesus has changed my life. Is he the only way to God? I don't know. He's the way to God for me. Have you, have you come to Alpha? I mean, I don't know what it is, but just share what God's done in your life. Don't feel this large psychological pressure to answer all the questions of the universe. Because my guess is they really haven't thought through them all either. They're, they're probably, the level of lack of understanding you have, they probably have the same thing. I very, very rarely meet people who are like deeply, deeply read in all the fields of human knowledge with these curated arguments against God. I'm not saying they're out there. I'm just saying it's not the typical person. I don't know, man. I couldn't see. Now I can see. The testimonial style. Second style uh, is the invitational style. Now, this is John chapter 4. Again, this is another one of these uh, scandalous encounters with Jesus. Jesus is going through Samaria. They, they hate the Samaritans. The Jews and Samaritans have major, major conflict. And the Samaritans, they believed, were a half-breed, half-race. They compromised when they were in exile. And uh, the Jews believed that they should have died rather than uh, intermarried with the pagan nations around them because it was a very, very strong violation of God's commandments. And so these people still have these longings for the God of Israel, even though they're not socially accepted. So they invent their own synagogues and their own places of worship. And Jesus comes to this well, it's Jacob's well. And as he's there uh, in the middle of the day, this is a total scandal. His disciples don't have the courage to confront him, but they say to themselves, what is Jesus doing talking to this woman? And uh, so Jesus is embracing this scandal. So he says, so by the way, talk about having a tough day. You've got a woman who is in a group of outcasts and she's the outcast of the outcasts. And then this is who Jesus wants to chat with. So Jesus is talking to her. And you've got to imagine these guys just going, we're never going to get invited to this synagogue Christmas party again. And they wouldn't have had a Christmas party because Jesus hadn't died. So it was a Hanukkah party. It's a Hanukkah party. But you can just imagine them going, like, whatever social capital we've had, it's over. And yet Jesus gives her this word of knowledge. Hey, you've been married multiple times. And I, I want to give you living water. And her response is, yes, I want. Give me this living water. 
So she receives this living water and then she goes back to her village and outcast of the outcasts and they respond. And this is what she says, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. That's her response. Just like, come and see. And now what did Jesus tell her? All of her sin doesn't even seem to be a problem. The word of knowledge that revealed her sin wasn't a problem. She's like, just come and look. He just, he's supernatural. He's the Messiah. Come and meet him. And uh, this is incredible. I read a statistic recently that said 82% of people are open to coming to church if they're invited. And I was like, nah, that's not true. That's old. So I did some further research and found that, yes, it is more secular. And now it's only 63% of people who are willing to come to church if somebody would invite them. Don't say no for people. Let someone say no for themselves. How many of you ever like got turned down for a date? I certainly have. Have you been turned down for a date? Did you basically say, that's it, I'm never going on a date again, that's it. One person said no. No, you're back in the game. You're back in the game. You're still here. You're available. You're doing your thing. My whole point is, don't say no for people. Don't let it break your heart. It doesn't work out, whatever. Somebody just says, no, I'm busy. And you go, okay, sweet. And you just get on with your life. This past week in Manhattan, 120 people came to an evangelistic study thing. I want you to see that in the middle of secular New York, 120 people were like, I'm interested in finding out if there's more to life than this. In the middle of New York City. Don't say no for people. Look, life is hard for everybody. And sometimes all you have to say is, look, just come and see. Come and see. Like, you want to pop in? You want to check it out? And if I say no, you go, hey, no worries, man. That's it. But everybody can invite someone to something. Next style is the confrontational style. This one's very popular in Times Square. The confrontational <laughs> style. It's, uh, there's an account that we actually see here in Acts chapter 2 where the Apostle Peter, in an assumed religious context, stands up. And these are the words he says, with many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Okay. Now, I sometimes think, seriously, they may be the only sincere Christians in the whole of New York City. Like sometimes I think that. You know, what we do is we read our favorite scene in the ministry of Jesus, the one that normally shows us personally the most mercy when we screw up. And then we just paste that as the only portrait of Jesus that is biblical. But if you've ever read the Gospels, this is why you should always read the Gospels every day slowly. Jesus just doesn't say what you thought he says. You remembered it wrong. Trust me, Jesus talks about hell more than anybody in the Bible. Jesus says things like, don't just fear those who can kill the body. Fear him who can throw both body and soul into hell. And you're like, that's hate speech. That's Jesus in his great love talking to us. And so the sometimes, normally eights on the Enneagram, sometimes there's these people who are like, they need hard truth. Like the, some people need this wake up call and they need the hard word. They need the strong word of conviction to be able to actually get to them. There is a legitimate place for hard warnings of the gospel of Jesus. There's, a hard, there's, a, there's an important need for that. There is a confrontational style. Then there's also uh, the next one's in the intellectual style. Again, back to Acts 17, you've got the Apostle Paul here, and he is in the leading center of philosophy in his day. He's with these Greek philosophers, and he does something extraordinary. He leaves the synagogue, and then he goes into the marketplace, which is not quite the workplace, but it's similar, and he begins just to talk about Jesus. And he does such an extraordinary job that the leading thinkers, the cultural elites of his day say, that, now that is fascinating. Why don't you come up? to the, the proper, you know, curated level of thoughtfulness and begin to dialogue with these particular ideas. And so Paul comes up, he, he talks to the Epicureans and Stoic philosophers, surprisingly Stoicism and Epicureanism having a bit of a run in our own day. And uh, when he gets up there, what does he say? He quotes, he uses defensive logic, he, lose, he uses poetry, he uses philosophy, he uses snippets of their own religion. He basically starts with where they are. You see, the confrontational style is starting with God's word. The intellectual style is starting with wherever the person is and then building a bridge to Jesus from there. And this is actually very, very important in our world today. I sometimes hear people say, young people don't care about arguments for God. And I'm like, I mean, please don't write a generation off because you talked with two stone kids at a Starbucks. Please, <laughs> please. There is a tremendous need for apologetics. 
and to make a credible defense of the faith. The more we deal with these complex ethical issues, issues, what does it mean to be human? The more we deal with human sexuality, what is love and how do we express that in, in, in bodies and relationships? How does legislation match that? When we talk about interacting with other faiths or what does it mean to have all of these different religions and truth claims, people need to think through this stuff and bring us the fruit of their research. There's a tremendous need for the intellectual style in our world today. Now, if you are this style, you already know this, and you're already frustrated at how long I'm preaching because you will wish you were back on some sort of like message board just grinding out arguments against other people. So I'm just saying this is an important style, and we need this in the church. I'm so thankful for the people that have this intellectual style. A couple more. There's a relational style. 1 Thessalonians 2, because we loved you so much, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. I love this. This is sort of like put together with hospitality where you just find those people who bring you into their heart. Have you ever met someone like that? And, and they, you know, they may not just say, I don't know, I was blind, but now I can see. And they may not say, come and see. They might just say, look, here's a sit at, my ta- here, sit at our table, man. Just pour your heart out. Just pour your heart out. David Asperger says, being listened to is so close to being loved, the average person cannot tell the difference. That's true. Just when someone pours out their heart and they just listen, you just feel seen. You feel known. Christian Morganston says, home is not the building you live in. Home is wherever you're understood. And it feels like this when you finally meet people who just, they don't just open their minds to you. They open, they make room in their hearts for you. They just listen to you and they just listen to your arguments and they listen to your problems and they listen to all of the stuff you're wrestling through and they just give you the gospel and their lives. And I'm very, very grateful for the people who just have this relational style. They don't just bring you the gospel, they they bring you themselves. They make space and they listen. And in New York, where people are so busy and, and margin is the golden calf, you see these people willing just to give scandalous amounts of time for other people. The next style is the supernatural style. And these are people who are just like all about the kingdom Jesus stuff. And you see this in Acts chapter 3. This is an account where Peter and John, post-Pentecost, are still observing the Jewish prayer hours. And they're going up to worship. And, as, and so in this particular sort of environment, the people who had disabilities, who had to beg for a living, would basically place themselves at the entrance to religious, uh, religious gatherings so that they could access the compassion of the people going in. And in one of these encounters, where like one man gets more than he bargained for, says when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. And as it, Peter looked straight at him, as did John. So there's like an intense stare down in this dynamic. And then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. And Peter says, silver or gold I do not have. But what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. And he gets up and it's on. I love that. Imagine what was Peter thinking? Peter who's denied Jesus. Peter who has, has run off. Peter who's a failure. Peter who's gone back to fishing is recommissioned by Jesus. And now he knows he carries in himself healing power. That's not bad. That's good restoration. And so he's walking around and he's basically looking for opportunities to manifest not just the truth of the gospel, but the power of the gospel. And I believe that this is vital and this is important for us today. And I want to plead with you, please come to this Ron Walburn workshop on Wednesday night. It's free. We have uh, room for some more folks in there, but we just need you to register so we can get uh, the right amount of supplies and all the rest of it. Here's why I like Ron Walburn. Uh, I took Ron uh, for a seminary class uh, at Alliance Theological Seminary here in New York. And I've taken, you know, lots of seminary classes. And in some of them, you come away and you're like, wow, that was amazing. In other ones, you're like, wow, that wasn't that amazing. (laughs) But there was no professor I've ever had, and I've had some staggeringly good professors, who at the end of his class would say, now we're just going to invite the God we've talked about to come and meet us. And then he'd sort of close the book and that invite the Holy Spirit to come. And there's you know, demonic manifestations and there's people being freed up and there's people under deaths crying out to God. And I remember just thinking to myself, this guy just taught the stuff and now he's doing this stuff. I love this guy. And so he is very, very thoughtful. He's the dean of a seminary, for goodness sake, but he moves in tremendous power. And he's basically going to, I asked him to come in and do this specific seminar for our church. And it's why in the West do we see so few miracles released when it's happening all over the world. 
So he basically is going to try and deconstruct the Western framework and introduce us to a kingdom framework. Very helpful. But I say all that to say we need more of the power of God. Jesus can't just be an idea. He's going to be a living person bringing power and deliverance to everybody we meet. We need this supernatural style. So if this is you, you have a heart for this, and you're like a treasure hunter, or you're like doing all the, the stuff that comes with that, bless you. May your tribe increase. We need this. This is a legitimate way. So much of Jesus' ministry was a supernatural ministry. We need more of that in the city of New York. And then the last one here, this is sort of like, I would call like the responsive style, but it's perhaps also like the jazz of evangelism as well. This is um, someone who's just like up for whatever God says to do whatever, wherever. (laughs) So they just sort of Holy Spirit's coming on me. I'm getting ready. I'm about to flow. And they just do whatever. This right here is your boy, Philip. Look what happens in Acts chapter 8. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, so by the way, it is a little easier because he's got an angel telling him what to do. Okay, so I give that. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now this is in the middle of nowhere. It's desert. So he starts out and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all of the treasury of Kandake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. And so you know what happens in this encounter? The Ethiopian eunuch is, is reading the book of Isaiah and he's, uh, he's up in his chariot. And then, you know, Philip's just like, hey, there's not a lot going on on the road right now. What are you reading? He's like, well, actually, I'm reading the book of Isaiah. And he goes, oh, do you like it? And he goes, yeah, it's good. Somewhat confusing. I wish there was uh, somebody here sent from God to explain it. And he's like, well, you know, as it turns out, I've got a few minutes, so can I hop up and, you know, oh, I I know quite a bit about that. And then he basically shares with him, and the Ethiopian has this extraordinary response. Now, you know, in the Old Testament, it says that that anybody who um, has crushed testicles, this is in the Bible, anybody who has crushed testicles or is a eunuch who's surgically altered sexual minority, they can't participate in the covenant worship. And so he's probably sitting here going, look, I'm reading about Jesus and I'm very, very interested in this. Is there a place for me? Is there a place for me? And so I believe that when he asks uh, about being baptized and he's saying there's water and he says, is there anything stopping me? I think he's basically saying, look, I understand the Old Testament. It doesn't work for me. But then he understands that in that same book of Isaiah, in Isaiah 56, there's this beautiful promise that will happen when the Messiah comes. It says, let not the eunuch say, I am but a dry tree. I will bring eunuchs into my house, give them a name better than a name of sons and daughters. I will fill them with joy in my house and my house should be called a house of prayer for all nations. There's a promise for these people that were formerly cast out that they could belong, they would be grafted in and that they would find joy in God's presence. And so they, they pop down to get baptized in the desert and you know what happens, Philip is teleported, it's quite extraordinary. So my whole point is he's just ready. She's just ready for whatever. Go to the desert. Okay. Some angel shows up. He's like, hello, good to talk to you. He's just ready. He's responding to whatever happens. I have one or two friends like this. They drive me crazy. Drive me crazy. No normalcy in their lives. And they're always like at lunch. They're like, excuse me just a minute, just before the drinks come. I feel like I've got a word for that person over there. Just going to pop over and share it. And they go over and there's tears and there's all this response. And then I'm drinking their drinks. And we're sitting around and then... An hour later, they're like, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. And uh, these people, they just, they just have this sort of supernatural jazz awareness like of just what God is doing around them. And so to one of my friends, I just said, I was like, why are our days so different? And he said, well, every morning I wake up and I have this conviction that I'm not trying to talk God into meeting people that God is wanting to meet people absolutely everywhere and all he's looking for is people who are tuned into what he wants to do in the world and willing to respond. So every day I wake up and I say, God, I know your heart is to reconcile the world to yourself. So give me divine appointments because I make myself available to God and I assume he's actually listening to me. I just believe that he's organizing human history around me and he knows the cries of all those people and he's putting him in my path and I just share whatever the spirit has for me. I was like, oh, Okay, well, that's, that's probably why we're having different days then. That's, prob- that's probably why. But I just love this heart, this willingness to respond to whatever the Spirit is saying. So just let me pause for a sec. If you find yourself in one of those styles, there's eight of them. Are you in there somewhere? I bet you are. 
You see, I have a conviction that you've been born at this time of history because you're the best person in all of history to reach the people who are around you. That's why you're here. And God shows your unique personality. The thing that you think disqualifies you probably actually qualifies you for the people that you're called to reach. And so God has crafted your personality. He's made you who you are. He's put you at this time of history. He's put you in this place and he wants to use you. He's just looking for people who say, give me divine appointments. Let me join you in my work. So I want to be a church and I want to call us to be a church that embraces the scandal, the scandal of evangelism. See, if you really spend time with those far from Jesus, bringing the kingdom of God to the places of darkness, it will make the religious people squirm. There will be murmurings about you. There will be grumblings about you. There will be concerns about you. There will be worries about you. But Jesus never let those things shut his heart and his compassion down. He says this, There is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 righteous people who don't need to. And look, I say this really seriously right now to our church. Our church right now is in a season of extraordinary growth extraordinary growth. We're having the largest offerings we've ever had. We're having like attendance problems where we're trying to stagger services. See you at the 6.30, my new slogan. We're trying to get you, we're trying to like literally figure out how do we not have to have bigger venues and how can we just sort of catch a breath and make disciples and all the rest of it. I just want to say this, if our church grows by 10,000 more people and it's just the 99 righteous, we will not be a success as a church. It's the wrong metric system. Money and attendance are not the chief dynamics in the kingdom of God. Someone has to change the metric where they say, we're willing to leave the 5% to go after the 95%. And if all of us as the people of God tune in to what the Spirit is saying around us, we have Jesus' heart inside of us, we're going to see that God is moving everywhere and He's just looking for people to partner with Him. I don't, want, I don't want to get a vision. If you could look down at this gathering tonight, I'm sure it would look cool and big and full and all that sort of stuff. But this is not the most important dynamic. Let's show this picture here. This is a, a picture from my backyard. I think Tyler took this and I love this. This is someone who met Jesus getting baptized in my backyard. And here's what I love about this, this picture because, you know, I live just over in Hell's Kitchen. And I just love this image. I, you can imagine the angels getting ready to join in worship. They're like, oh, church is on tonight. Church is on tonight. They're all excited. They're like, ah, look, we really appreciate the praises, but we did kind of hope that we could rejoice because the kingdom of heaven's advancing. So we just kind of have to settle for the glory to God, which we're obviously very large proponents of. But we did hope there'd be an extension of Jesus' love to the lost. Then, ah. But I love this view because you sort of get, you, get, you see the angels just like, oh, hang on, hang on. We got some newbies in the house tonight and they're gathering around. You can just hear the applause of heaven. You can hear the rejoicing of the angels when people far from God find their way back home, when the dead are raised back to life, where people find life in Jesus. And you can hear them say, come on, come on, come on. This beautiful image right here. So I want us to be a people who have the, not just Jesus shepherding care, but Jesus missional heart in all of us that wherever we go, in some way, shape, or form, we want to get our friends to meet Jesus. See, I love that scene in Luke chapter 5 with the, you know, the four friends who have their, their mates paralyzed and he's on a mat. And they're like, if we get him to Jesus, Jesus can heal him. They can't heal him. That's why they're obviously trying to get him to Jesus. And so they get him to Jesus and they get to the house and they're like, the house is full. And they're not like, sorry, mate, are you used to being lame? Look, well, then just accept. They're like, nah, we're getting in. You can see him trying to get in the window. Ah, someone's sitting in the window. They push him in. He elbows him. All right, all right, get it. They try and get in the door packed out. And then one guy just says, stuff it, walks up on the roof and just starts pulling through the roof. And you can see the Pharisees, they're like, what, 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 what is happening? What is happening right here? It's not proper. It's not in the manual, you know. And they're just, they don't, but then the roof pops open and this bloke comes down in a mat. His friends are like, Jesus, here's our friend. They're just lowering him down. And then Jesus says something that is heresy, except that Jesus said it. It says that Jesus says, when he saw their faith, he said to him, man, your sins are forgiven. When he saw their faith, 
He said, look, I don't understand exactly how that works, but I just do know this. Desperation unleashes crazy things. Crazy things. They were just willing to do whatever it takes. I've just got to get my friend to Jesus. He's the only one. So I want us to be that sort of church. Don't you want to be that sort of person who just refuses to take no for an answer and is literally like pulling the roof off to get people in the room so they can encounter Jesus? I want to be that sort of person. I know in your heart you do too. I know you want to say, look, man, I don't know. I was blind, but I can see. I know in your heart you want to say, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. I know in your heart you want to warn people to avoid the wrath of God and receive His life. I know in your heart you want to make space so that people can come in and receive the good news of the gospel in your life. I know you want to see miracles unleashed that wake people up to the spiritual realm. I know you want to be an evangelist of great jazz skillfulness where you just respond wherever the Spirit's moving. I know it's in your heart, and I want to call you to it. I want to call you to it. Let's be people who leave the 5% for the 95%. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me pray for us. Father, we come into your presence now, Lord, and we just ask, we ask that you, shepherd of the sheep, would give us your great heart. We're you who are willing to leave the 99 to find the one, Lord. We just pray, wake our hearts up. Let us feel what you feel. And we just pray, God, that you would just put this loving, passionate desire in our hearts. That sons and daughters who are far from you would come home, Lord. The prodigals would return, that the dead would come back to life. And that your kingdom would advance here. Much rejoicing in heaven, in New York, because the kingdom of God is advancing. So we open our hearts to you. We receive and respond to the invitation from your word. That's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite the stands we close in worship.